very glad to have here today Darren Tang. He's a mathematician, but he has devoted himself uh, lately a lot to the Dash project, if I can say. Yeah. So yeah. I'm very honored to have him here. And his name was suggested by the Dash community. And so please, Darren, it's all to you. All right. Thank you very much. So uh, today, I want to uh, tell you about consensus among computer networks. And, um, and I, I, I feel like uh, the Dash uh, uh, programmers have come up with uh, something new that's kind of ahead of the uh, academic, uh, 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 the academic uh, papers. So I, I think there's a, a room for like a, a survey article here or something like that. Anyway, um, so, uh, so what I'd like to tell you is basically um, about consensus kind of in a historical context. And then I'd like to go into detail about the newer, uh, uh, the newer progressions. So uh, historically, uh, you know, at least in computer science, uh, there, there was this concept of Byzantine fault tolerance that uh, uh, was used to keep uh, basically to try to keep a, a network in consensus, um, but if you may be aware of there, there were certain problems with that. It, it, it didn't work all the way and it's, it's actually in the name itself. It's a fault tolerance. It's not a consensus. Um, and then uh, in 2009, there was a, a paper by a pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto and uh, they, uh, th there came out a, a new way for uh, computers to actually remain in consensus and have some certainty that they were actually following the same consensus as, as the network. And so uh, I call that type of consensus a Nakamoto consensus. And then um, lately, I think uh, Dash, I mean, lately means in the past couple of years, I think the Dash uh, programming team, uh, Dash core group or, or the programming team in general uh, has, uh, has a, uh, come up with a new way uh, to have consensus. And, and uh, we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. It's uh, bootstrapped by a Nakamoto consensus. So it's kind of building on top of a Nakamoto consensus. But uh, uh, it's, in, my, in my mind, it's, it's very exciting. Uh, so, uh, and so I'm very happy I, have the, I, I got an invitation to tell you about this today. So and my background is math. So I, I did focus a little bit more on the math because that's what I like. Uh, but if you wanted to kind of historically follow this, I picked one paper out of several uh, practical Byzantine fault tolerance. Uh, that was kind of a breakthrough in Byzantine fault tolerance. You could read things before that that are even more historical and things after that that are um, uh, more modern. But uh, I just felt like that was a kind of a break in the pipeline if, if you're just interested in this topic. Uh, yeah, but uh, uh, but definitely, I would recommend reading uh, uh, this uh, Bitcoin paper, and and you can see the slides, which I put a link to in the uh, chat. That uh, you can click on it and get the actual paper pulled up. Um, so uh, this was a paper published in two thousand nine that uh, created a new consensus. And then, uh, what I want to draw your attention today, t t your attention to today, are the Dash improvement proposal specifically, oops, specifically two, three, six, and eight. Um, so if you look at on GitHub, there's this Dash improvement proposals and uh, they're of all different types so that you can see that there's two, three, uh, six, seven, and eight, six through eight. So uh, th those are the ones I wanted to focus on, but if you got interested in this topic, uh, four is related to the same uh, stuff. It's kind of, four is kind of a, uh, um, how, how you do what we're talking about more efficiently. Um, and uh, I wasn't able to cover everything. So anyway, so uh, basically, if you're interested in this topic, I think that uh, Dash Improvement proposals two, three, maybe four, six through eight are uh, where to start. And, and if you just go through those, I think they're, they're nice in general. I, I think they're well written. Uh, I wrote a little bit of them, but uh, uh, I, I, and I helped on some of them, but uh, I do think that the, the, the end product was really polished. There's a lot of people that worked on those. So, um, but, but they're, they're engineering specs. They're not uh, academic works, so to speak, but I think there's room to 
bring it over, cross it over to the academic world. Uh, Byzantine fault tolerance in general. So, uh, you know, for an open network, uh, if you were trying to keep uh, that network in some type of consensus or find the bad actors in that consensus. So, so uh, just uh, the wording for a while, for a minute, the Byzantines basically, so if somebody's like a Byzantine node, it's a node that's actually trying to keep uh, you're trying to knock your consensus out, trying to ruin your network. So ba basically, uh, sometimes when we do this analysis, we call those Byzantine ac actors. So um, Byzantine fault tolerance in an open network is vulnerable to civil attacks. Uh, somebody could pretend to be seven, eight, 20 people and uh, have uh, more influence over the network. Uh, Byzantine fault tolerance generally fails when, uh, when over a third of the nodes are malicious. Now, uh, if you look through the literature, some people have tweaked it a little bit. I mean, the avalanche might have pushed that to like 35% instead of 33, but uh, uh, so generally, uh, that's what I say, uh, requires, and it also requires multiple communication rounds. And I, th I think that's something um, that uh, sh we should kind of be focused on uh, when we're comparing these uh, types of things. And, and um, if you look th through the literature, at least the literature that was cited, uh, basically the Nakamoto work is more or less independent of the Byzantine work or Byzantine fault tolerance, but uh, uh, th th that's just interesting to look at. So uh, with a Nakamoto consensus, an open network uh, that, that uh, basically uh, goes into consensus along with uh, Satoshi Nakamoto's paper, it mitigates a civil attack with a proof of work. So, um, so now it's not just how many uh, nodes can you run? It's how how much processor power you have, and that introduces a cost with gaining influence over the network, and and that actually does a pretty good job of mitigating civil attacks. Um, the, the, now this is the biggest deal actually, and I, I think it's not uh, really uh, uh, focused on enough. But uh, a Nakamoto consensus can be um, verified by a passive node, so you can spin up a node and um, and uh, uh, look through all the blocks, and you could actually make sure you could actually uh, verify that yes, you're in consensus as a whole net as a whole network is consensus, um, uh, and and that's more or less a certainty as long as you're connected to one node that's uh, not misrepresenting the network. Um, anyway, so and then uh, uh, something I think is very beautiful about uh, Nakamoto paper is uh, that uh, Nakamoto network generally runs at a stable Nash equilibrium. So um, if, if all the actors are in search of a profit um, and nobody has more than half the uh, processing power, um, gen then the uh, network should run at a Nash equilibrium, which means that uh, anybody that's uh, searching for profit will actually reinforce the rules of the network. So, uh, so there's that. <laughs> And I said, if, and then um, <clears throat> the original paper by Satoshi Nakamoto had that threshold at, at 50%, but uh, there's been some work later that uh, uh, weakens that down a little bit till 33%, but uh, that it, it's not like, it's not the same as if you had 50%. It just, you can have undue influence if you have over 33%. All right, so just um, if you haven't read the Nakamoto paper, I, I just wanted to kind of give you an idea. So um, uh, in, in my mind, or the way I think of a, a Nakamoto consensus, it keeps a consensus about one thing that's called, I call it a global state. And, um, and the blocks, so you've probably heard the word blockchain. So the blocks in the chain are more or less instructions for changing the global state. So uh, with Bitcoin, the global state would be all the unspent transaction outputs. So it's basically the balance at all the accounts in the whole network on the whole system. And then uh, instructions on how to change those balances could be thought they are transactions. So basically all the blocks have the transactions and uh, the, the uh, consensus is kept about like what the balances are. Now, uh, kind of this is somewhat your perspective you could have the perspective that block five in the chain is you know it's hard it would be hard to ever spoof that block five because it's buried under a proof of work um, so you could say that uh, there is consensus about block five but 
uh, when you're uh, when you're having your node run, uh, the node's mainly interested in keeping track of the UTXO, uh, unspent transaction output, set of unspent transaction outputs. Okay, so a Nakamoto, a Nakamoto network could be out of consensus. So, uh, you know, it's possible that uh, when people are mining blocks, they could mine uh, one block seven and some maybe on a different part of the network, they didn't see the block seven yet. Uh, they could mine a different block and so i just put uh, seven prime there and so this um, this this diagram shows a blockchain where the most recent changes that is the transactions in block seven could be in dispute you could have a transaction in block seven that's not in seven prime and and vice versa uh, but you could also have the same transaction in block seven and block seven prime um, now consensus is still maintained over old changes like just because the network is more is in this state where the, the the top block the highest block the the chain tip it's called is uh somewhat in dispute that doesn't change the fact that block six was agreed upon and all of that now uh, there are deeper reorganizations that can happen i just wanted to make a simple diagram so um now with the nakamoto, nakamoto network generally the uh, general and that means in the past decade the network the bitcoin network has always co collapsed into a consensus and the way it does that is follow the longest chain so as soon as a new block block eight comes in uh to to the network um, then everybody all the nodes that learn about block eight will start will basically collapse down to put block seven prime in their chain and and then start uh try to bind block nine over block eight and then in this case block seven is called an orphan block and it will not affect the utxo at all however transactions in block seven could be in block seven prime and block eight so it's it's not like your transaction gets uh lost lost it's not certainty at all it's actually likely to be in the other blocks okay so now uh so the new thing, so in the past two years, uh, is uh, Dash consensus. So that's that's when I'm uh, naming it. I don't think it has a name, but uh, in academic circles, you just start naming it, and then other people write other papers and they name it something else they want. But that that's how it works, and eventually, eventually, a name becomes so popular that that's the name of it. Uh, so the remaining uh, portion of the seminar will be for explaining what I call Dash cement consensus implementations. Um, I would love to go abstractly about what this could do, but uh, that's beyond the scope of what what I could get done. Um, and uh, more, and also, I'm most excited about what is actually here and now uh, today. So uh, per, everything in this talk is actually uh, on a live mainnet, uh, specifically Dash. Okay, so uh, we're going to first have a quick overview of what Dash consensus is. Um, we're going to talk about uh, a choice of threshold signature scheme. I saw some of the advertisements for this um, uh, to, to advertise that we're going to talk about crypto. So why not? Let's talk about what kind of what kind of uh, uh, thought process went into uh, choosing what type of threshold signature to do. And then uh, 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 then I would like to go into the Byzantine resistance, which uh, uh, I was talking to a member of Dash, uh, the Dash team, and they uh, called it Quorum Math. I thought that was a cute little name, um, but uh, uh, th th this type of math was needed to be done to uh, to understand how secure this would be. Um, and so uh, we'll have a little bit of time to talk about uh, applications of chain locks and instant send. Okay, so. Uh, Good. And those, those are what I consider to be the two main applications that are live on the network. However, um, I mean, if you had a club of people and you needed to be in consensus on something or decide on what everybody signed or not, uh, you could you you could you know it's, it's it's pretty open what you could do with this. Okay, uh, and 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 it's and and chain locks and instant send is actually some of the more complicated applications of this, which is, uh, I've glossed over some things, but anyway. So uh, what is Dash consensus? So let's have a quick overview. Uh, Dash consensus requires a blockchain to provide a Nakamoto consensus. So uh, with a Dash consensus, it's more or less bootstrapped by 
a Nakamoto consensus. So that's the first thing you need to have. Um, and Dash uses a proof of work Nakamoto consensus. Um, and then, um, then the, the next part is uh, to register actors on chain with a public key. And, um, uh, and, uh, and in our application, uh, the Dash Networks application, those actors are nodes. They are people or actors that are operating a computer, or you can think of the computers themselves to be the actors. Um, but uh, it, but um, it, this is very general. You could have any actors uh, registered themselves on a, on a Nakamoto, on a chain with a public key. And then um, what, what is done is there's a subset selected that uh, of all the registered actors that's called a quorum. And then um, that quorum will produce a threshold signature of either a statement or some type of type of datum uh, that is in consensus. So uh, if, if the, uh, if the uh, quorum uh, has determined that, okay, this datum is in consensus, it'll produce a signature to signal that. And then again, a passive node could verify that signature. And uh, All right, so um, now uh, one thing that was, it's kind of annoying about this type of consensus when we do the security analysis of this type of consensus is that it actually depends on uh, the uh, number of actors that are registered. It depends on the uh, number of actors that are selected in a quorum. Uh, so uh, a subset of N actors is a quorum. So it's a little lowercase n is uh, what I'm, saying is a quorum size and uh, uh, for secure, uh, and then also uh, when you do a threshold signature, uh, generally you should always ask for to be uh, and have a simple majority, but there's no reason to stop there. You can actually uh, make the threshold whatever you want. It could be 60% of the actors, 70% of the actors, 80% of actors. And you can imagine that choice of threshold will affect the security level. Um, and uh, just the way the math works out, it, the security level does depend on the, the whole number of registered actors, and it depends on the quorum size and the uh, threshold. So, uh, so it's nice to have a term dash consensus, but basically when I use that term, I'm referring to a family of consensuses that has, it's a three parameter family. Um, generally, it's a good idea to uh, have your threshold require at least a simple majority. Uh, that's not really required for security, but uh, it gets a little weird. Like if you had a 40% threshold and the Byzantine actor had over 40% of the nodes, there's a good chance that they could, you know, produce conflicting statements, signed conflicting statements or something like that. So you, you for security reason, you generally want your threshold to, be, to require at least a simple majority. Um, we assume that a quorum of n nodes is a simple random sample of the m registered. Now, uh, you know, randomness in a computer is kind of a hard thing to do. And so in practice, um, a simple random sa sample is simulated using hash functions. And, uh, and that's actually not an easy task to do, but uh, that is what is done. Uh, it, that's explained in the dips, I believe, yeah. And then um, and, uh, also to help with the randomness, it, you, I believe the uh, a recent block hash is fed into those hash functions. So you, you get an extra source of entropy. Um, it's very hard to uh, manipulate uh, the uh, block hash if you try to do that uh, by a guess and check method, uh, you possibly could lose out on money. It would be, there's an economic incentive for that block hash to be uh, uh, not be uh, skewed in one way or another. Okay, so, um, but uh, I'm gonna assume that uh, the quorum is a simple random sample and you can look through the hash functions and uh, see if that's, uh, a, a decent way enough of getting a simple random sample. So uh, I just wanted to uh, illustrate that this was, uh, or is exactly um, 
what uh, this is already live. So this is one example of a transaction that uh, you could look up. Uh, of course, like you <laughs> would be trouble to type in this hash. And, uh, but this is a simple transaction that has one input and one output. And this is kind of representative with these types of transactions. Now, and this is just public on the chain data. So um, you can click the raw transaction. And when you do that, it, you'll see among other things, something that looks like this. So uh, this transaction kind of has hidden in it extra data than just a normal, uh, just a transaction telling where money goes. It has um, what is actually singled out as an extra payload. And um, you can see some aspects of that extra payload here. Uh, there's a collateral hash and a collateral index, and that will identify one unspent transaction output that has to be exactly a thousand dash. Uh, uh, that's, that's a civil attack mitigation measure. Um, uh, there are owner addresses. Uh, there's an owner address, a voting address, and a payout address. And those are to uh, serve different functions in the Dash network. Uh, it can allow uh, the, the collateral to be on one machine, but the owner address can kind of update information about, uh, about this uh, node without uh, being on a machine with the collateral. Uh, the voter address can be on it. Again, the, vote, the, the voter, uh, the Dash network will vote on some things to, uh, it, it's the oldest operating DAO that required, that, that DAO operation requires voting. So you can register your voting key on a different machine and uh, it could be a machine with no dash at all and uh, you can carry that machine around and if it's hacked you've only lost the voting which you can fix uh, you haven't lost any money and then uh, there's a payout address which is the address that will be paid uh, uh, basically in uh, as uh, compensation for running a node so somebody has to be running a node and prove that they run a node uh, but the big, biggest thing is this uh, public key operator, what's flagged as public key operator. And it's a hexadecimal encoding of a BLS key, which um, with, with BLS, there's a, that, that re BLS refers to a paper with three authors with those initials. And um, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about BLS signatures in a bit. And uh, it's, it's this BLS key that's needed for the dash consensus. So everything else is kind of extraneous to the dash consensus that I'm, I, I want to point out to you. But, uh, but uh, that BLS key is there. OK, now uh, let's spend some time uh, about some crypto. And mind you, this is a very low level crypto. Um, I mean, like it's low level in the sense that it's kind of glossed over some details. Um, but I want to talk about Schnorr signatures and BLS signatures. So I want to comp basically compare those two. And, uh, and I, I just kind of give you a slight uh, diving into the literature so that you can kind of know where to start when you want to compare these two. And then I'll tell you what my personal conclusion is, and then you can dive in the literature and figure out if you agree. So uh, a naive multi-signature um, so I've been talking about threshold signatures. Well, threshold signatures are kind of hard and it's um, some, so when I think about this stuff, I think in kind of a naive fashion about uh, multi-signatures. So with a multi-signature, uh, uh, you, you have three actors that publish three keys and then kind of in its simplest form, a multi-signature is a valid signature for the sum of the three keys. And uh, now uh, that's a gross simplification. Don't use this slide in production, uh, depending on what your application is, but it kind of gives you an idea of what the goal is behind uh, a multi-signature. It's trying to produce one signature that can verify three at the same time, okay? That's what it is. And I just used three, but you could have 50 actors. So you could have 700 actors and uh, a multi-signature could verify that all 700 
uh, those signed off and it could be a very quick uh, computation and it, the signature is very small to store. It's the same size as, as just a simple signature. So um, one thing that didn't make it onto the slides is uh, multi-signature that's on chain in Bitcoin right now, uh, but it also was inherited by Dash. That multi-signature has uh, the property that it grows with the, like if it's an M of N signature, it grows with M. So that's bad. It grows linearly with M. So, uh, and then the signature is on chain. So uh, the, the information on chain is uh, at least certainly the Bitcoin blockchains full on occasions. And uh, so, so you would like to cut down that size if possible. Um, if you wanted to understand the whole crypto space and you were interested in Schnorr signatures, um, you might study Bitcoin Cash because they have a, uh, a live implementation of Schnorr signatures on their, uh, on their client and it, it's live on their, uh, in their whole network. Uh, but those Schnorr signatures that are used are used to basically when you have a transaction that draws from three inputs, it can combine the signature from those three inputs to one. So it does save on information, but I don't believe the Schnorr signatures are used for multi-party situation. Um, so if you had a multiple party, like three people wanted to sign off, I don't know if the software is made to do that. And I don't know if the security audit has been done for that either. Uh, but uh, I believe what, the, what is live on the network is fine for Bitcoin Cash. It works, uh, and uh, if you wanted to, if you were working on a blockchain project, I think you could port that over and learn from that. And I believe there's some value on the Schnorr signatures that are brought in. Okay, so uh, one reason that this previous uh, slide is so, the naive multiple signature slide, what makes it so naive is it because it completely ignores a related key attack. So, um, we have three actors, Alice, Bob, and our malicious actor, uh, Malroy. Uh, they want to construct a multi-signature. Now, um, Alice and Bob being, you know, they're just actors that are going to go along with the protocol and do what they're supposed to do. Uh, they uh, will publish, they will first acquire their public key, hopefully with a good random number generator, acquire their private key, and they'll publish their public key, okay? And, um, you know, that, no problem with that, publish the public key. But Malroy will obtain a private key for the public key C, but he, he might publish the public key C minus A minus B, okay? Now, uh, I should say, uh, anyway, so I'm, I might not have said by now that the, these capital letters are uh, public key, keys, um, both with Schnorr and BLS, they're, they're points on curves. With points on curves, you can add them. If you look at some uh, literature, they use, it, uh, they use it as a multiplicative group. So sometimes they talk about multiplying points and sometimes they act about adding points. But uh, when you boil it straight down, when you're dealing with elliptic curves, there's a natural additive group. Add, by additive, I just mean commutative group that can be there and some people choose to use a, 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 a product notation for that, uh, for that operation. I'm, I kind of gravitate towards an additive notation because in math, we use additive notation for commutative groups. So anyway, so Malroy publishes C minus A minus B, which you can, if, if anybody knew A and B, and of course Malroy knows C, anybody can compute. It's easy to compute A minus B minus C, like just math. Uh, elliptic curve math. And then the aggregate signature would be uh, A plus B, but then instead of plus C, it would be plus C minus A minus B. And again, it's a commutative group, so that commutative associative group, so it, uh, it'll all reduce down to C. And so what Malroy has been able to do is to uh, make the, um, make the uh, multi-signature key a key that he knows the prime key to. And so he can do all the multi-signatures he wants, but he can never sign anything for the key that he published because he doesn't actually know the private key for C minus A minus B. Okay, so since Malroy knows the corresponding private C, uh, C 
uh, he can, yeah, good. He can construct an aggregate signature without Alice and Bob, which is or, um, a multi-signature without Alice and Bob. So that's kind of defeats the purpose of multi-signature. So Malroy was successful in the related key attack. Okay, so um, advantages of, a sh of all both these schemes. So the Snor signatures, one reason you see those around so much is they can work with ECDSA keys. Um, they're not the same signature as EDC to SA, but they can use the exact same key. So one reason they are talked about so much is because it basically preserves backwards compatibility. At least on a blockchain, it would be a hard fork to bring in store signatures as, it, as Bitcoin Cash did, but um, it wouldn't require uh, new addresses or anything like that. Now, BRS signatures, they do require new keys and it's, uh, they don't even use ECDSA's keys, but they are, the keys are public keys of a curve. Uh, but their BLS signatures have a, uh, a, an advantage that they're easier to construct on a fly, and uh, the multi-BLS signatures and the threshold BLS signatures have a smaller attack surface. So, uh, good. Now, I'm, I made this slide and I was like, okay, where am I going to cite this? Uh, and so I, I found some citations that will come up. So, but uh, let's just make a long story short why BLS uh, was chosen. Uh, Schnorr signatures require each party to provide entropy. This entropy is combined before a signature can be constructed. If something goes wrong in the entropy stage, the process must start over, okay? And reusing entropy could allow a private key to be solved for, okay? Now, if I cited that, I actually went back to Snore's paper. That's, you know, it's in, in, when he introduced the Snore signature. Um, and uh, this actually makes the problem not sound as bad as it is. When I'm just talking about entropy, what I shoved under the rug is um, each party creates entropy, but they only share, they only share that entropy obfuscated, like with a, obfuscated with a, uh, the entropy that the party will create will be a, a private key. And then what it shares is a, a point on the curve, a public key. And so that, 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 that entropy, the private part, the, the entropy has a private part and a public part. Compromising the private part could compromise the signature. Compr um, and reusing uh, the public part could compromise the signature. <laughs> it's, it's, and that's what I'm saying is a bigger attack service. You've got all, because of, at this entropy stage, that's more or less adds to your attack service. And BLS signatures do not require this entropy. So I kind of, that's the long story short why one would want to use BLS signatures as opposed to Schnorr signature. Okay, so uh, let's cite uh, some of this. So I found uh, this paper, uh, simple Schnorr signatures, multi-signatures with applications. Of course, you could you look back to the original paper by Schnorr, it's in there as well. But uh, I highlighted this port part, aborts the, abort the protocol if this is not the case. And so you just look at this, you can see, do all of this stuff, okay? Do all of this stuff. And then if something goes wrong, you have to start over. Okay, that's exactly what I was trying to tell you. And you can, if you want the citation, there it is. Okay. And then, um, so in one of the BLS papers, the one that actually did threshold papers, it said uh, signing protocol is non-interactive, right? So here, whoops, excuse me, which the previous one. Okay, previous slide. So here you can see that they're, they're having communication rounds and then they have to abort if something goes wrong, but um, it's explicitly in the multi-signature uh, paper um, that uh, the signing protocol for the BLS situation is non-interactive. And if you wanna look at that paper, it's right here. Um, you can just click that link on the slides. Um, great. So. Um, now, I, I did, after I made the previous slide, I was like, oh, you could get confused by that slide. Uh, for, for dealing, so the previous slide is more or less talking about a multi-signature where it's a, an N of N situation. 
But for a threshold signature where you have like an M of N situation, where you don't require everybody to sign, just a threshold of people to sign, uh, it has an interactive distributive key generation phase. So, um, so uh, if you wanted to do a threshold signature, you need all the parties to talk to each other for a few iterations. And then after that is done, there's uh, one key that's decided upon and all the threshold uh, signatures can happen with that one key. So uh, you can see that after all threshold signatures are, uh, after that, after the distributed key generation, then the uh, threshold signatures are non-interactive. Okay, so uh, for a T out of N threshold signature, the party, uh, any party with a bit more than T signature shares can create a valid threshold signature. So um, you don't have to be a party to this. As long as you get enough signature shares, you can create a threshold signature. And, uh, and that's part of the non-interactive part. So a passive uh, observer, as long as they're getting uh, the, the partial signatures that each of the actors are creating, they can uh, reconstruct the threshold signature. Okay, now, uh, Byzantine resistance. So this, I, I'd say this is the part I more or less did. Um, uh, I was asked about this several times uh, working for Dash Core Group. Uh, I've less Cash Core Group, but uh, I generally get asked this every year. Uh, you know, I, I offer to help still, and I get asked this every year, more or less, which is fine. I, I mean, I'm happy to answer questions. So anyway, the Byzantine actor a Byzantine actor attempts to disrupt or alter a dash MNT consensus by registering or controlling nodes. Okay, so that's kind of the attack we're laying out. And so there are two types of more or less successful attacks that the Byzantine actor can employ. They can do, there's basically two bad things they can do. They can do one bad thing, which is akin to and is an, in fact a denial of service attack. If they control uh, if the actor controls more than n minus t nodes in the quorum, uh, they can prevent a signature from being performed. Performed, so they can actually deny service to the quorum. If the quorum is supposed to provide the service of uh, si threshold signatures, if the attack if the attacker gets more than n minus t uh, uh, nodes in that quorum, they can just sit there and not do any signature shares and nobody can make it that it's you know cryptographically impossible for any uh, threshold signatures to be formed so i think that would be in the uh, class of a denial of service attack and then uh, the, the other type of attack i just call the byzantine hijack if an actor controls more than or equal to t nodes then they can produce any signature then you know then they have the full threshold of nodes that they need to uh, produce a signature so they could um, uh, they could compete. They could um, produce competing signatures. You know that would like like basically sign opposite statements. They could they could they could only sign the things that their buddies like and not sign the things they don't. So that that would that's a more severe situation. Okay, and if you go through uh, the uh, the the dips that I told you about dash improvement proposals, uh, you, you'll you'll kind of see through it that um, the denial of, if the denial of service ever happened, uh, the Dash network actually falls back on, a not, on its Nakamoto consensus. So, uh, so a, a denial of, if a denial of service attack in this uh, context ever happened, then uh, the Dash network would fall back on the security that Bitcoin has. So, it's kind of crazy in this world, but the, 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 there's kind of extra security on Dash. Okay, now let's see, where's the math? Okay, here's the math abstractly, um, what we would do to calculate this. Um, there are, so, uh, you know, in statistics, you talk about your sample space, that's the space of all outcomes. And so if you're choosing N nodes out of M, there are M, choose n ways to do that. And this, uh, this uh, symbol here with the parentheses is uh, how most mathematicians like to write m choose n. Uh, on, on some other texts, it's writing 
written with an M and then a capital C and then a low, little like a, a subscript of M, capital C, subscript of N. Um, and, and it's a binomial coefficient, which if, if you just want to do some recreational math, I, that's always fun uh, to look up these binomial co coefficients. They're related to Pascal's triangle. They're related to the binomial theorem. They're related to all kinds of stuff. And they show up all kinds of places, including here. And then, um, it, and then uh, so you have your sample space, which is basically all possible outcomes. And uh, you, want, you might ask, well, how many of those outcomes uh, uh, have exactly B out of the M nodes that are Byzantine? And uh, then you, you can compute this by taking N minus B, choose N minus T, and multiply that by B, choose T. And so this, this is like part of the outcomes where the Byzantine actor would have enough nodes to do a hijack attack. And so, um, and, and uh, to calculate any probability, this is where the simple random sample comes into play. Uh, simple random sample means all the choices are equally likely. So it's just the probability of the attacker being successful is just the number of outcomes where they are successful divided by the total number of outcomes. Uh, and this is what this is. So you just sum up um, the chances that the, uh, attacker has exactly T nodes, has exactly T plus one nodes, has exactly T plus two nodes, exactly T plus three nodes until you get to either N or you get to B. And there's, if the Byzantine attacker can't have more than B nodes, if there's only B nodes on the network. So, uh, so th that's what this uh, equation is. Now, I, th this whole slide is all the math that's behind this. So it is, kind of easy abstractly. Now, here's uh, how that calculation works. Now, um, if you try to put 5,000 choose 400 into, uh, into uh, Google, you're gonna get a problem. And uh, so uh, to, to actually calculate the probabilities, what I use is a Python script. So um, I, I use this function to, um, to con compute the binomial coefficients. And Python, I, 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 I will sing the praises of Python for somebody who wants to do uh, calculations, because this will give you the exact number. And, um, and then uh, this is uh, what camp ca calculates that sum right here. And then uh, actually to do the division, Python will choke on that, but Python has a nice logarithm function that will uh, basically allow me to do the division. <laughs> so I, I even have to massage Python to get it to work with these big numbers. Uh, th these functions aren't used for this particular script. They were used in a different script. And uh, I, I, more or less, I guess they're artifacts. I forgot to delete them. And then here's, uh, here's uh, where it output uh, this calculation to give me the probability and it you know, goes through a loop. So it outputs several things. And uh, when you do that, you'll get these probabilities. So, uh, so for this type of consensus, which is a consensus used by the network, uh, if the Byzantine actor has 5% uh, of the nodes, uh, there's practically no chance of a DOS attack and, pro and extremely no chance of a hijack attack in one go. Now, um, to, to actually know if this is secure or not, um, the quorum formation for this particular consensus happens every 12 hours. So uh, there's only twice a day the attacker has an opportunity to um, to, to either DOS the quorum or hijack the quorum. And so these twice a day, it has this chance. I, I would say that's uh, cryptographically secure. Uh, we're, we're getting a lot, we're getting to the level of hash collisions. Um, so if, 10, if the attacker has 10% of all of the M nodes, uh, which is 500 nodes, uh, these are the chances still quite small. And for this particular consensus, it only happens twice a day. So I'd say we're pretty secure with that. If the attacker has 20% of the nodes, 
still quite small. I think we're pretty good. 30% of the nodes, well, there's a like a three out of a million chance here that the attacker could do a DOS, but there's still, you know, it's practically impossible to, you know, to do, to hijack it in any given day. And then uh, I put 34% here on purpose because I wanted to um, compare this to uh, Byzantine fault tolerance. So this is kind of when Byzantine fault tolerance starts to break down, but we can still see there's less than a three out of uh, 1,000 or maybe less than four out of 1,000 chance of a DOS happening. And uh, it's still quite improbable to hijack. So I, I think this is what should make the academic community uh, take notice because, you know, with the Byzantine consent or Byzantine fault tolerance, um, that we basically get failure. Um, and uh, with this type of consensus, we get. Uh, we still get a lot of security, even with the attacker having a third, over a third of the nodes. And then uh, there's kind of almost ridiculous scenarios where uh, the attacker has 40% of the nodes and about half the, this, this makes sense about half the time they could perform a DOS because they're right at, almost at that. If there's, this is at, at a 60% threshold. So, um, it's, it would basically take 40% to withhold it. Um, and the reason why it's not exactly half is to actually withhold a signature, you need one over the, the, the 40% to uh, withhold the signature. And then the hijack uh, probability, um, it's still quite small, <laughs> okay? So, so even at 40%, you can't rely on having a, a, a uh, a, a chain law uh, 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 can't rely on having this signature, but you still are guarded against having a malicious signature. And at 50%, uh, it's almost certain that the attacker can uh, deny service. And, um, but there's still less than a two out of what, 100,000 chance that uh, the attacker will hijack any one given form. So that's even at 50%, we're there. And um, uh, th these types of calculations is what um, helped guide what type of consensus to use by making the threshold higher here at 60%. It makes the hijack much harder, but allows the DOS uh, to be easier. So it's, it's just a trade-off a DOS falls back on Nakamoto consensus that's already very secure, so the consequences aren't that severe. Hijack could be forking of the uh, network, which is pretty severe, or forking or, or um, uh, giving advantages to your friends, all kinds of stuff. Uh, anyway, so, so it just, it's, it's made this way on purpose. To, the hijack is harder to do than the DOS. Okay. Uh, so another um, consensus that's used right now live on the network is uh, dash 5050 30 consensus. So uh, they take quorums of size 50 and they need 30 to get a valid threshold and we can compute these same numbers. Um, <laughs> the DOS is actually better once we get uh, uh, on up to these higher numbers, uh, but, uh, but for the lower numbers, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the DOS is a little bit less. Now these are used for signatures that are needed more often. So they're smaller quorum and they're easier to handle. Um, also this gives us a, a, a larger selection of uh, quorums, which that has some advantages too uh, for this. Um, basically there's a whole bunch of, this is uh, the, the consensus that's used for instant send. So there's, uh, every transaction needs to have one of these signatures. So uh, ha by having more quorums, it's kind of distributing the work uh, in a way, uh, kind of in a better way. Uh, anyway, so we only, uh, a node only has to deal with like one out of a thousand uh, tra transactions or, or actually inputs that are spent with this type of consensus. So um, we can still see it's quite secure uh, even at the 34% level, uh, you know, less than a two out of 10,000 chance, I guess, 
um, and so I'm, I'm trying to move the decimal place in my head. So notice I can make a trout. I, I can make an error there. So check me. Um, anyway, so uh, the applications of this, and I, I mentioned a little bit. So uh, the instant send uses on the previous slide the M5030 consensus when there's M active national zone network. I assumed uh, 5,000. Currently, there's over 4,900. So uh, you know, 5,000 is just a nice round number to do these calculations with. But you, I, I provided the script. You can change that number if you want. Um, let's see. Uh, so uh, you can do an instant uh, send lock. Uh, so uh, the instant send lock. So basically, once a transaction is submitted to the network, each input uh, is assigned to one of these quorums, the, the, the quorum of 50. And uh, then a threshold signature will be put on that transaction for that input. And for the next input, it will go different quorum. And, same thing. And so once that signature is there, uh, any transaction that uh, sends that input to a different address is uh, considered invalid by the network. Uh, so this, this, this is what requires dash, or this is what uh, allows instant send to work and what allows it to be secure. So once that signature is in place, then the Nakamoto consensus rules are uh, uh, won't allow a uh, conflicting transaction. So this is something that I wasn't able to impress very well uh, in, in this hour that I prepared for. Uh, but there's an interplay going on here between the Dash consensus and the Nakamoto consensus. And that's what's, that kind of gives a huge security boost to everything in this. And um, so by, by having the protocol, the Nakamoto protocol uh, and uh, actually depend on the dash consensus protocol, we kind of get that combining of, uh, of security. And there's also chain locks, which are alive. They use the M400-240 consensus. And, um, and then uh, let's see. Uh, so, uh, uh, so with with that one, that's used for chain locks, and uh, and so uh, basically, if there's ever a, uh, so once a new block is submitted to the network, the the quorum of four hundred will say, oh, this was the first scene. Uh, there'll be a signing request. There could be a few rounds, interactive rounds, to actually determine that everybody's going to sign the same thing. Once it's determined that everybody's going to sign the same thing then the actual signature happens. Uh, and the, the nodes are programmed in a way that once you have one real signature, then you won't do any more. So that, can, that, that stops conflicting things. Uh, that, uh, that means even without a Byzantine uh, operator, on occasion, the chain lock could fail. Uh, but, but I haven't told you what a chain lock is. So, uh, but once a chain lock is live on the network, the valid threshold signature is on the network, then um, that pr previous situation where the network is um, not sure about its ne pre next block, which is in, uh, in this diagram, uh, one, if there was a chain lock about block seven or a block, block seven prime, the whole network would collapse. And generally this happens in about two seconds Whereas the, the Bitcoin network would take about 10 minutes for another block to come out and then it would collapse. So with Dash using chain locks, they can, they can basically collapse to a consensus in two seconds where um, Bitcoin uh, requires 10 minutes to get some, a good amount of certainty on which way to go. And then uh, it could, take another 10 minutes to get even more certainty and another 10 minutes to get more certainty and more certainty. But, but once you have a chain lock, you have you know, extreme certainty. Um, one, uh, one thing, one little caveat is if block seven and block seven prime actually kind of were on separate parts of the network and were seen by 50, you know, like 50 and 50 or 55 and 45% of the, of the network, or let's say 50, 50, um, there's a chance that they couldn't 
uh, they couldn't actually come to consensus on what was first seen uh, because really there is no consensus about who saw what first. And, um, and then uh, as is in the uh, dips, the network would fall back on the Nakamoto consensus, which has you know, so far been proven to be very secure. So uh, good. So this gives us an extra application of instant send and chain locks. Uh, so uh, one way I think about it, instant send provides security um, bef before, uh, before the transaction is actually included in a block and then chain locks provide security after it's included in a block. So uh, again, it's a proof of work system, pretty much just like Bitcoin, but um, uh, there's extra security before um, a transaction is actually included in a block and there's extra security after a block is included in the chain. So uh, that's what the Dash network has. I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna end this with a one live interview or one live demo, which I thought was kind of fun. Okay. So, um, so I, you know, uh, so this choosing these binomial coefficients are uh, very common. So I'm just gonna type 10 choose two into Google and um, Google's gonna tell me that's 45. It's 10 times nine over two, great. So now if I ask Google what, uh, what uh, 5,000 choose 400 is, um, I get undefined. Now it's really not undefined, but um, basically there was an overflow and Google, shame on you Google, you didn't say overflow, you said undefined, which is actually technically incorrect. But let's ask Wolfram Alpha what 5,000 choose 400 is. And, um, oops, okay, that was asking DuckDuckGo, so I do WA. Uh, so this is, goes to Wolfram Alpha, and it says, okay, we want to compute 5,000 choose 400, and um, um, it's this, this many digits. <laughs> Here's all the digits right here. And uh, if you have trouble counting that many digits, that's 603 digits. So that's a really big number, or excuse me, 604 digits, because you got the, yeah. anyway. Um, uh, this is how you would compute it. Uh, this is kind of a closed form for how to compute it, but th that's the reason, one reason this number is so big is because there's a factorial in it. And then uh, these are other ways of writing the same number. So, uh, and, and the Google representation. Anyway, so uh, these, these uh, binomial coefficients are, are very common in the literature and mathematicians can use them. Um, but, uh, you know, in practice for doing the calculations, I would recommend uh, Py or I recommend Python. If you had to do these calculations on the fly for a, a project, like if you had like in consumer use software, I, I don't think no, a Python would be the thing to use, but uh, you, you should ask somebody else if you want to do that. So good. So thank you very much.